Politicians may get away with bad governance in Nigeria, says DG Nigerian Institute of International Affairs, Egosa Osage. Tonight on Civic Education, we take a look at the history of governance in Nigeria and the effect on the forthcoming election. And uh, I will not be demoralized, Peter Obi says, as Doyin Okukwe steps down as Director General Obi Dati Campaign Organization. This is Plus Politics. My name is Nyamgul Agaji. The Director General Nigerian Institute of International Affairs, Lagos, Professor Egosa Osage, has warned that politicians in the country will continue to get away with bad governance because the electorate had been bought over and consistently sell themselves as commodities during elections. He noted that as long as the nation depends its democracy along such a trajectory, the nation will continue to retrogress into low levels of development adding also that the way to deepen democracy in Nigeria is for all stakeholders to participate and watch those trusted with political power so they can be accountable. We are being joined to discuss this by Adenike Aloba, Program Director and Managing Director, Datafied. Welcome to the program, Adenike. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here this evening. We also have Mr. Shegun Shokpeton, a political analyst. Glad to have you join us on the program, Mr. Shokpeton. Thanks for having me. Good evening, everybody. Okay, let us begin uh, uh, by getting your comments on uh, Osage's submission. Let's start with the ladies. Ladies first, as they say. So, Nike, what's your take on his submission? You know, as uh, difficult a pill as it still is to swallow in terms of how Nigerians are and what has marked or marked our democracy, he's not wrong. He really is not wrong. Um, I, I mean, I have my thoughts around the answer to that question, to the question or the challenge that he's pointing out. But the reality is, it's not wrong. For as long as uh, people are willing to sell their votes, for as long as people are willing to be bamboozled by politicians, uh, I mean, yes, the national is loud and it's all there and everyone is making a lot of noise about the national, but a lot of things are happening at the sub-national level. A lot of atrocities, a lot of corruption, a lot of governors who pop up every four years, a lot of, I mean, a number of our states don't have local government, uh, uh, local government administrations. So he's not wrong in saying that for as long as uh, uh, um, Nigeria remains as is, we may continue to deal with bad governance. We may continue to deal with bad governance. I mean, I read in his comments that he said that Nigeria's, you know, deepening democracy has not translated into development. And essentially, it is because for somehow, I mean, we, we do know the reasons why, and I hope we get to discuss it uh, tonight, uh, Nigerians keep voting in these leaders who do not take the country forward. And so 20 years down the line, uh, democracy, we're holding another elections in less than two months. But, you know, if, if you speak to a number of people, not a lot of people are hopeful about what the outcome will be in terms of true development for the country. All of the manifestos that are now out notwithstanding. So he's not, he's not wrong uh, in his assessment of the country and its democracy. Okay, Mr. Shokiton, let me just have your opinion, too, before we move on to other issues. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, his statement is, an, is, you know, basically just um, um, echoing our reality. Our reality is that um, go government officials and governments will continue to get away with do more than as long as... Um, we have the version of democracy that we practice. And, um, you know, when when we even say, like when he says in his comments that um, in spite of the deepening of democracy in Nigeria, we do not have um, a commensurate in increase in 
the de delivery of governance to Nigerians. I, I would even say, you know, how do you measure the deepening of democracy in Nigeria? Um, a lot of people will tell you that we we are still very very far off from practicing a true democracy, a proper, inclusive, and representative democracy um, in this country, and and that might be one of the key reasons why you have you know the the problem that he's he's uh, pointing at you know so for example what are the measures of democracy elections free fair credible elections and we all know you know where we are in that regard it's it's been a very very rough journey uh, granted INEC has um, made some some um, uh, plan some prohibitions over the last couple of elections um, and we've seen the introduction of the beavers which from the result of the mid-cycle elections, we can say it will make a significant difference for the general elections, but we we'll wait to see how that will turn out. So there's the issue of elections, and, and we all know how voter turnout has been for Nigeria. You know, we've never achieved 40%, uh, for example, as, as um, turnout of citizens. If you go to turnout of um, registered um, um, voters, it's, it's a completely different story. It's worse. Um, you know, so then there's the issue of participation, there's the issue of freedom of expression. You know, the more you go into those measures of uh, the depth of a democracy, the worse we fare. For example, freedom of expression. You, you, we all remember the NSAS debacle and how that ended. And as long as you have um, a, a country where citizens are afraid to speak out, where people speak out and get shot, or where people speak out and end up in jail, then you can't have a, 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 a democracy that delivers governance. And, and I think that's perhaps you know, one of the biggest challenges where we really, really need to find a way to improve the entire democratic experience of Nigeria. Until we do that, then we continue to um, have shadows. Okay, Nike, you, you spoke something about uh, selecting leaders, and both of you have said something about that. And uh, we're dealing with um, uh, leaders that do things and get away with it. And we talked about voting the right people into office. But it, it's a tricky thing because most of the people that have voted into, at least a, a lot of them that I know, were very good people, as it were. And they got into office and became something else. Is there something that we're missing? There's things that the citizens need to do. We have town hall meetings. We have, uh, we have other things that we do. C civil society organizations are there to say the things that need to be done and hold the government accountable and all that. Even though the traditional institution has become a political thing that they can hire and fire, the political class mm. can hire and fire as they like. But we need to know what else, what else we need to do to make sure we deepen this democracy in such a way that instead of the people fearing the people in power, the people in power should yeah, be the yeah. one afraid of the citizens. So, um, Nigeria is, so as soon as I saw this conversation, you know, my mind went straight to the statistics around multidimensional poverty in the country. Mm. And it's 133 million Nigerians and one of the thoughts that troubled me the most about the idea of multidimensional poverty was that the buzzword was everywhere, but people were not quite, uh, I'm not sure people were clear on what it meant. What it meant was that Nigerians were doing an opportunity cost of things like health, things like education, things like feeding. I'll connect it to elections in a minute. Now, when we say, oh, why are you buying why are you selling your vote don't you know that you know you you don't need to sell your vote we we ignore us and this conversation is heavy you know in the elite communities oh nigerians deserve the leaders they have you know they're not voting in the right people and things like that i think that we significantly undermine the impact of such depravity on on, on our people on ourselves as a country we undermine the effect it has. We undermine what it will mean, what people will interpret as development. For instance, zonal intervention projects over the last 20 years of Nigeria's democracy is still today being celebrated as if some senator has donated something to the community. Now, in your beautiful house where you have your WC, you know, and you have, you know, 
all the amenities. It looks like, why would you be celebrating a pee toilet? But for people who do not have access to wash services, that's a victory. If that is being sold to them as, hey, don't let anybody deceive you. When you voted me the last time, I built a toilet. They're going to believe that. We have to be able to connect. And I think this is really important when we're having conversation about how to change, you know, how to change the trajectory of Nigeria's development and democracy, how to change people's voting behaviors, essentially. This, this is what we're saying, how the people can ask the right questions, how the people can have the right conversations, how the people can know the right questions to ask. We have to consider what development really means to a hungry man. Mm. But, if we give some consideration to that, then it allows us to rethink how we engage with the people in the communication of, oh, this is what development should look like. If you consider that the person you're talking to is not, does not have access to the internet, so all of the you know, buzz that is happening on social media around who to vote for, who not to vote for, what the issues are, they don't have access to that. All they know is this, uh, uh, this uh, senator came, our governor came, and he made the road into our village. That's the person I'm going to vote for. So when we're having a conversation about how to change voting behavior, we really need to drill down a little more into what is driving voter behavior. What is driving it? And I think a large part, a significant part of what is driving voting behavior is just the amount of deprivation that is, I mean, Today, infl inflation is not only in the double digits, but it has risen consecutively for the last uh, 10 months. Now, if some governor or some person, some senator or some governor, whoever it is, and I'm very deliberate about using senator and governor and House of Reps members because governance is not just the president. And I think that's another conversation we need to have and have and have. Don't just focus on who is going to become the president. Your governor is important. Your local government chairman is important. When that guy comes around and says, oh, yeah, don't worry, you know, and distributes bags of rice. Today, even local rice is selling higher than 30,000 naira. So it, we, to engage the conversation of what needs to change, uh, what the people need to do differently, we really do need to understand what is driving the behavior of voting and then communicate in that language. And one thing that in the last couple of months, you know, sitting on my chair as a managing editor and reviewing stories and people's angles and reading everybody's work, one thing that is clear to me is it's going to take time. And we can't pop out of the woodwork every four years to say, Nigerians, you have to vote better. No, it can't, it can't be every time an election is just around the corner that we then begin to make statements like, oh, we are the reason we have bad governance. We've got to keep talking about these things up. I mean, it's, there's no vacuum. We shouldn't have a four-year gap in which there's no voter education happening, there's no civic education happening, mm -hmm. and then once it's two months to the elections, we all pop out of our woodwork. My experience is that when we go, especially to the lo localities, to tell them that, hey, guys, this is what you should focus on, they trust us even less than the politicians who come and distribute 2,000 naira. Because this is what they tell you. Four years ago, you came here, you told us not to do this, you told us not, and you disappeared, we never heard from you again. Now you are back here again, who is paying you? That's the reality. And so we, we have to give a lot of thought to what is driving people's voting behavior and why we're choosing these leaders that we seem to be choosing and then deal with that problem, not from an elitist point of view of, oh, what's wrong with people? And I'm, I'm repeating this because I've heard that said a lot. You know, Nigeria, Nigerians, Nigerians, they're just, you know, Nigerians are bad. They're just choosing bad leaders. If we're going to turn things around, we need to be a lot more deliberate. We need to be a lot more calculated about changing people's voting behavior. Okay. Uh, it's Mr. Shopperton, you, you said something about uh, the voting uh, strength of Nigeria in all elections has always been like 40% or a little above that. And whether it is 20% or 40%, leaders still get elected into office. And let's look at that as the deed is done. Now, beyond voting these people into office, holding them accountable is the real crux of the matter. It's as if when they go there, they, are, they have the free hand to do whatever they want to do. And that's why my concern was when I asked the question that we have town hall meetings and we have civil societies talking, but it seems not to be enough. What else do we need to add? Because even the, the talk about people being poor, 
much as that might be true, I've seen societies where they don't lack food, at least food. But when you go there on an election day, you give uh, 100 naira, you give 500 naira, they sell their vote. And they, they're just saying, this is what I can see from government, let me just take it. And they, they, they do whatever you have asked them to do, and they don't care about it. Now, what do we do beyond the election? That is one of them. Let us know whether these voices coming from civil societies, town hall meetings, and every other places that we have been using to talk are not enough. What else do we need to do? Well, okay, so thank you. I think um, you are speaking um, uh, to a wider um, aspect of the conversation, you know, because like, like I said before, um, the, the first thing that we need to do is to perhaps uh, disaggregate what exactly we mean by democracy and what that is supposed to do for people. Um, when we say we are running democracy in Nigeria, what exactly do we mean? Are we are we running a democracy? Because having elections in itself it is not necessarily an indication that you have a democracy. Uh, they have some sort of elections in, in China, you know. In fact, I think they have some sort of elections in North Korea. <laughs> so, you know, having, having just elections in themselves do not necessarily give you the democratic environment within which you can then hold politicians accountable, as is the conversation, the subject of the conversation we're having this evening. It goes way beyond that. So the first part is the elections, and they're very, very important because that's how these politicians emerge and that's how they get access to political office. Um, but Beyond that, we need to look at the other things that has to happen. Um, so different um, organizations and agencies around the world have different ways of framing the question of how to measure the depth or the quality of a democracy. Uh, so for example, the Economic um, Intelligence Unit, the Economist Intelligence Unit uh, talks about elections, participation, uh, functioning of government itself, you know, uh, political culture, civil liberties. Uh, Freedom House, which is another very, very well used um, uh, measure of the depth of a democracy, it talks about elections, talks about participation as well, talks about functioning of government as well, but then looks at the rule of law, um, looks at organizational rights, you know, and stuff like that, and then individual rights. If we look at these things, and then, like Biola said, one of the things, one of the biggest mistakes that the country, uh, our society makes is the entire democratic experience has been reduced to a four-year election cycle and you know as long as we keep doing that um we're, we're not ready we're not ready for development we have to ensure that the conversation so the elections will come every four years the general election whatever election it is by our constitution is four years um except for the local government elections that are three years and we all know how that goes um, in most places they don't even happen at all and where they do the end of those exercises, I won't call them elections, would have been determined in somebody's bedroom before the, the activity actually goes ahead. You know, so going beyond the elections, which is where the majority of people will participate by, by um, uh, exercising their franchise to determine who rules them or who governs them or who runs their lives and determine the policies that affect them on a day-to-day -day basis. The other parts of democracy still need to be deepened. We need to have this, you know, this idea of, for example, um, the active and engaged citizen is such a key part of the democratic experiment. And I always like to say that you can't, you, you can't look anywhere in the world where democracy is delivering good governance and not see a country or a society where citizens are actively engaged in the governance process. Mm -hmm. So engagement in what terms? Engagement in terms of asking questions, engagement in terms of demanding accountability on a consistent and systematic basis, you know, um, engagement in terms of um, um, uh, protests, you know, and all of that. We need a lot of these things to happen consistently in our society beyond the four-year cycle before we can begin to talk about how to get uh, democracy or the politicians to deliver good governance you know okay, okay. so 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 the, the commission must continue 
along those lines. Um, how do we get civil society? And remember, the, when it comes to elections, that's where you have the largest levels of participation. But the more, the moment you move into those other areas of engagement and involvement, the number of people that can participate are fewer, you know, and the number of people that can participate really will be the, the segment of society that should be able to do so, which is the middle class elite, you know, the people that Biola refers to as talking about, um, you know, Nigeria getting the leaders that we deserve and all of that. The truth is that there's so much more that we can do and um, not minding and not withstanding uh, the fact that our governments are very repressive. Till today, our governments are repressive. You know, they've, they've enacted laws, for example, like the Cybercrime Act, that talks about, you know, there are so many people that have been jailed in this country, as I speak today, journalists that have been jailed for heckling government officials, just simply for, they call it bullying. Like, I write a story that um, a governor uh, issued a contract to his nephew, and has done so repeatedly for four years. And then I get picked up by DSS or the police and I get put in jail. And I even get taken to court and sentenced. You know, in this country, Nigeria, you know, that, that's happening. So all of these things need to be looked into. And we need to develop a space where conversations can be had freely, okay. without fear, so that we can then begin to hold our elected officials um, more accountable than what we have now. Very, very, very important. Let me come to you, uh, uh, Nikkei, uh, very briefly now. Um, do you think we have any lessons that we have taken or we are going to take or we should take into 2023 uh, from previous elections that we have held in this country? What are those things we should be looking at as we go into 2023? Things we need to take from history, as it were, and make 2023 a better election year and Nigeria a better country beyond 2023? Thank you very much. Um, I think it's important that we all remember that it can actually get worse. And I don't want to be an alarmist. I, I, don't, I don't want people to panic. But where we are today should be a reminder that this is not, you know how people kind of say the national key cannot end, it cannot finish, you know. But even talking strictly about national cake in terms of money, um, the reserves are depleted. Nigeria is not able to turn around resources from its crude oil sales. Um, inflation is where it is, double digits, 24, uh, about 24% uh, in November. Um, things can actually get worse. Insecurity is higher. And I know that it feels like, oh, don't you want to draw lessons, like things that are positive? But I think where we are as a country today, I think it's important to... And I love the fact that Mr. Shopwitter talked about, you know, the elite, the middle class, because I feel like there's a bit of a, you know, almost like we're divorcing ourselves from the result of what we're seeing as Nigeria today. Almost like, you know, it's those people, they voted those people in. But I totally agree with him that we have a responsibility. Those of us who have access, those of us who know, who can spout data like this, who can say, oh, yeah, this is what happened in 1994. There are people who don't know, and we have a responsibility to them. And I think that we need to remember that national cake can end. Things can get worse. Today, for someone to travel intra, you know, Nigeria travel from Abuja to Kaduna, from Lagos to Abelkuta, has become a prayer point, has become a thing where you inform everybody else and everybody is worrying and checking on you. I think it is important for us to remember that the decision we're about to make in two, less than two months, is it's for chromic. It's, it's very important. Um, I, I don't know. I wish I had something positive to say, you know, like, you know, if we did this, we will get this. But I think it's important for us to remember that it can get worse. And we have to be that aware. And that has to drive our decision making, the kind of conversations we have around these elections. Yeah, well, it's, it's still positive, reminding the people that... <laughs> Suffer so never do. That's how we, we say it in Nigeria. And if you say that and somebody has it in mind, maybe it will inform our choices in 2023. Let's wrap up with you, uh, Mr. Shokwiton, your final word to Nigerians. Like uh, Nika said, she doesn't want to be an alarmist. And even in spite of all the things that we are looking at now, there's still hope for Nigeria. So what do you have to say to the people before we wrap up? Well, I, I think that's where we are at today. We should be alarmists because things are bad, you know. So I don't know why Nikkei doesn't want to be an alarmist. I think it should be, you know. <laughs> let's, let's get people to realize that this is, we're facing an existential threat, 
And if things continue on this trajectory, sir, ma, Nigerians, hear this well. If things continue on this trajectory, you might not have a country in five, ten years. I mean, it's just the reality. And I'm even being very um, um, conservative in saying five, ten years. It could be quicker than that. So 2023 is, is, is a watershed moment for us. We cannot, we must not get it wrong. If we get 2023 wrong, well, you know, you never can tell. Anything can happen. Um, we hope that whatever the outcome of the elections, the country continues to trudge along as we have done over the, the decades. But, you know, there is always a breaking point. So my word, my, my final word to, to people is, look, vote, don't vote your conscience in 2023. Vote with your brain. Vote with your eyes wide awake. Um, look right. at people that are in front of you and make sure that your choice makes sense logically, not emotionally, not tribe, not religion, not any of this, you know, very funny, mundane uh, considerations we always eventually fall back to that the politicians always drive us towards. Vote with your brain and your eyes wide open. Otherwise, we go here and more. <laughs> okay, what a way to end this segment. Thank you so much, Mr. Shokwetan, for coming on the program, and also uh, Denike uh, for being a wonderful light uh, to this discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, for the rest of us, thank you for staying with us. We take a short break now, and when we return, we will be looking at our last discussion on the resignation of the DG of the Obidati Campaign Council and Peter Obi's reaction to it. Stay with us.